My name is Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the head of the psychology department here, and I do appreciate the number of people who come to these uh, department speaker series. I know that there is this group here, and then I, I noticed that there's a large group of people who, for whatever reason, decided to be in the overflow room before it needed to be overflow, but you know, you'll get the information either way. This is the last of this year's series. Um, for those of you who have been to most of them, hopefully you've found them of value. We will uh, continue this series um, next year, so you can look to the college's website if you like the kind of topics that we've covered, everything from forensic psychology, psychology of love, ADHD, um, psychology of work. So we try and find topics that are meaningful both to students and the community. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Luke Gallen. Luke is an associate professor at Grand Valley State University. Um, Luke is trained as a clinical psychologist, um, but over the last several years has migrated um, to social psychology and then to the psychology of religion. His undergraduate degree is from Nebraska, and his PhD is from Wayne State, Wayne State Dr. Gallen. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Uh, it's a nice turnout today. Um, like Dr. Connor mentioned, my, um, uh, what I do right now at Grand Valley State is focus a lot on the psychology of religion. It's an actual class that I have. So a lot of what you're going to see today is actually condensed, uh, a condensed version of some of the stuff that I cover more in detail in my course. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll talk about things like religion and morality and uh, some of the sub areas of psychology like uh, neuropsychology and such. So uh, I have more detailed information. I kind of uh, summarized it today, but if we, uh, during the Q&A, if you want to go back over some of the points in more detail, then I can bust out my other material for my class and we can talk about it more in detail. But my topic today then is, as you see from the title, the uh, relationship between religion and morality. And so I'll talk about some of the different models of the two. So one of the first things we'll talk about is the perceptions of how those two things relate to each other. Do people think that religion and morality go together? Uh, and then we'll talk about the evidence of that. So I'll focus on some of the empirical studies and the work that look at different domains of morality and different types of religion to see how that actually uh, shakes out about whether they go together and with a focus on moral attitudes as well as moral behavior. Um, some of the models that I'll talk about today, one of the, 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 t the portion of my title that refers to the tail wagging the dog, the standard dog wagging the tail model is that your rationality, the cognitive processes are dominant and that they, uh, that you learn morality like a social learning type theory and that when you have moral emotions or reactions to that, that follows. Uh, but there are other different models from that. So uh, the, another model is that there are sources of morality or moral intuitions outside of social learning. You could call that an intuition or, or even an instinct. So we'll discuss that. Uh, and then throughout the, the, the talk, I'll give some examples of this, but we'll see whether, in fact, the relationship between the two areas of religion and morality, whether, in fact, um, what I'm going to argue is that there are areas of morality that... Uh, that religion rationalizes, that somebody first has a moral impulse and that they come up with reasons after the fact, uh, often religious reasons for acting um, in a moral or immoral way. So the first uh, topic then is people's perception of religion and morality. Uh, you probably can think of examples yourself where people have equated the two areas, but uh, this is actually you know, in the area of social psychology and personal perception of forming impressions of other people, this area has come up with, do people assume that one's moral behavior is associated with whether he or she is religious or not? So if you want to put it that way, is it necessary to be religious in order to be moral? Uh, there's survey data on this that we have, that when this question has been asked, you see that people are somewhat split on that, that uh, some people assume that it's necessary to be religious to be moral, and some people don't. That's, this survey was uh, of the American public, it's roughly half and half. Uh, other questions specifically focus on training children to be moral, and you can see that uh, here that it's actually a little bit more in the direction of yes, that children wouldn't be moral unless they had some sort of religious training. And only a minority of people say, no, you can just be just as moral with or without training. Um, in the political sphere, uh, some of you probably are aware of this, that uh, you know, the, often a candidate's 
uh, morality is judged on the basis of whether they present a religious image or not. So in some polls uh, that have been done with candidates in the election, they'll often have a category of would you vote for an otherwise qualified candidate who happens to be a, and then they'll insert a minority status like a, a Catholic, a Jew, an African American. Uh, uh, Non-religious really brings up the back of the pack. That is, it's, uh, if you're planning on being a presidential candidate, which you might be, the, uh, if you suggest in any way that you are not religious, that probably doesn't bode well for your, for your campaign. Uh, atheist, for example, is one of the least approved of categories. Now, uh, some of the things I'll talk about, though, like the empirical research on whether religion does go with morality. Mm -hmm. There are some studies that show that people perceive others to be more moral when they're religious in an experimental context. So this type of study might be something like where you're presented with various people to judge. You have to judge whether you like them or not or whether they seem like good people. And there's been some experiments that show that uh, religious uh, targets are evaluated as being good more than non-religious targets. The problem with that area, though, is, uh, is illustrated that, uh, through this. And that is, is that how much of the judgment of somebody's goodness or their morality is based on their actual goodness, something about their behavior, for example, versus the fact that the person judging them knows that they're religious or not. So to illustrate this schematically, you have a perceiver that's judging a target and making a decision, is this person moral or not? The problem that, uh, that in most studies is that they don't control for the f of whether the perceiver is religious and whether the target is portrayed as being religious. How do we know how good or moral the, the target really is when those things contaminate that? So this is actually the reason I'm harping on this is because I did a study in this area myself. I call this study the Jesus Fish Study, which the, the reasons for which will be uh, obvious in a second. But basically, the point of this study was to see whether the depicted religiosity of the the person being judged affects judgments of their morality. So what I did in this study then uh, is I uh, had subjects come in for the study and I knew how religious they were beforehand. They had filled out some questionnaires earlier in the semester. I used like a fundamentalism questionnaire where I could s specifically designate people that I knew were high on fundamentalism versus low in fundamentalism. And I brought them back later in time into the lab. Uh, they didn't know why they were invited to be in the experiment, but basically I told them you're going to be making judgments of impression formations of some students on a video. They also got like a little biographical sheet. But basically they were uh, watched a 10 or 15 minute interview with the person and then judge whether they liked them or how, and one of the questions was how moral, how good is this person? The people in the video were talking about what they did with the, over their spring break. But one of the, uh, one of the uh, three students was the manipulation. I changed whether this student was presented as being a religious person versus a specifically a not religious person. So we'll call him student B. So for example, when student B was discussing what he did over spring break, he said he did volunteer work. He built houses for uh, charity work. But here's where, the, uh, here's where the conditions varied. I varied whether or not he added that he did it for religious reasons versus he did it for secular reasons and he wasn't religious. So here are the various people that were interviewed and that person in the middle there, student B, was in the religious conditions, he said that he's building houses because he heard about it in church. There was a sermon uh, that said that we should build houses for the needy, and he thought that that was uh, a good idea to do for religious reasons. I also had a condition, by the way, where he didn't specifically mention religion, but he was wearing this shirt. Maybe not that shirt, but a shirt that looked like that. This is why I call it the Jesus Fish Study. So he was labeled as being a religious person. The other conditions were that he was doing the same thing, he was building houses for charity work, but he specifically said that he heard about it on the radio. And then I asked him, did you do this as part of a church? And he says, no, I don't go to church. It also said, by the way, on his biographical sheet, he doesn't, he's not religious in this condition. Now, the, the control t-shirt here was a, a Darwin fish here. You can see, again, that this labeled him as not being uh, religious. So again, uh, the point of the study was when students of various levels of religiosity are judging him on how religious he is, would his identification as being religious or not religious make a difference in their moral judgment? So there's four conditions as we saw. And then I, one of the questions specifically asked, how moral do you think this student is? And here's what I found. The low, the low religious subjects, these were students, again, who are at the bottom quarter of religiousness. Uh, you can see in the various conditions, they just didn't care. When judging his morality, they basically didn't, uh, didn't make a difference whether he was religious or not religious or what t-shirt he was wearing. Whereas the high religious students did care uh, and 
perhaps not surprisingly, when they saw that he was religious, they rated him as being more moral. When he was wearing a Jesus fish shirt, he was more moral, but the opposite when he was not religious or wearing the Darwin fish shirt. So this tells us a couple things. One is, is that there does seem to be a stereotype that if somebody uh, is religious, is portrayed as being religious too, that they are more judged as being more moral. And that's really a form of a stereotype formation that's based upon the match between the viewer and the person being viewed. That is uh, in-group favoritism. If I'm religious, I'm more likely to judge somebody's morality in the context of their religiousness. If I'm not religious, you can see it doesn't really matter. Okay? So uh, this sort of study you know, shows that I, I would argue that the problem with a lot of research is this stereotype, the self-perception. Now, to get away from psychology for just a second, to go back into philosophy, there are various models as to how religion and morality go together. If you've studied Plato's writings based uh, on Socrates' teachings, Socrates didn't leave any of his own thing, uh, there's a Euthyphro uh, dialogue where Socrates is discussing with his student how do we decide what is moral or not. And what Socrates pulls out of him using his uh, Socratic method, which is co uh, what a coincidence, that he um, he says, uh, is what is good, good? Does God decide what is good because he makes things good? That is, God commands, he decides that something's right and wrong, as opposed to the standards being outside of him, that basically God has no choice but to abide by standards because it is right. There are things that are just right and wrong, and God just happens to say, uh, to agree with those standards. You can see that there's problems with each of these for a religion and morality context, the first of which is, if God can make something good or not good, that's basically arbitrary. Uh, he could decide that murder is right or wrong and, and, and that would be good because he's God. The problem for the other part of this, the other horn of this dilemma is, if there are external standards to God or religion, why not just appeal to the standards themselves rather than through a religious context? That is, you could decide yourself what's good or not good. You don't have to be religious. So in this, uh, and uh, by the way, you can see him drinking his, his cup of poison there. Thanks for pointing that out, Socrates. People didn't like Socrates pointing those things out, so he's, uh, he's not long for this world there. But uh, you can see then that this, uh, this dilemma uh, is, I'm going to show you this is also relevant to psychology uh, of morality, and that is, is that does it change somebody's moral behavior for them to think that religion is based on whatever their, reli the, whatever their religious views say it is, that's what makes something moral or not? Now, uh, one argument would be, well, how, if we didn't have religion, how would we decide what is moral or not outside of a religious context? There are some theories in psychology, one of which I'll be mentioning uh, throughout today, and that's based on the work of Jonathan Haidt. Uh, he has done some research that suggests that, in general, when people are making moral decisions or not, they use five separate dimensions or factors uh, when deciding what's moral or not. By the way, you can go to his website, Moral Foundations, if you want to take some of his questionnaires that, to see how you score. But basically, uh, one dimension is that people decide what's right or wrong based on whether it harms somebody else or not versus cares for them. So a harm, care, empathy type thing that something's good if it protects other people from harm. Another dimension is whether that, the action uh, being considered is fair to everyone or not. Uh, a sense of justice. If my action is good for me but I don't want you to do it, that's not fair. So people might say that that's not moral. A third dimension is whether it something that favors my group as opposed to other groups, so like an in-group loyalty type thing. If something's unusual for my group, then it might be wrong, considered immoral. Uh, a fourth area is based on authority or respect for authorities. So for example, something's right if it conforms to what the authorities say you should do, obedience to, and whoever that authority happens to be. It could be the church, parents, the police, that sort of thing. And then finally, another dimension people consider with morality is a sense of purity versus taint taintedness. Some things strike us as wrong because they seem weird or disgusting. So basically, somebody using this dimension would say, why is it wrong? It's wrong just because it seems deviant and weird and disgusting. So uh, using these dimensions here, uh, people can use these to judge what's right or wrong. The problem with this is that what I'm going to show you is that people often differ on which of these they weight more heavily when deciding what's right or wrong. That is, uh, from a religious context, somebody might say something's right or wrong, uh, and religion might affect which of these they weight dimension-wise. Let me show you an example of that. Uh, this is a survey of attitudes of college students like yourselves. Uh, I think they're at UCLA. Yeah, they're at UCLA. And they asked them their opinion on various social and political questions like you see there. But they divided the students on the basis of whether the students were high or low 
on religious involvement. I think it was like church attendance or how much they, how many re religious activities they do. Now, the low and the high religious students didn't differ on some things very much at all. So, for example, affirmative action, uh, whether somebody's low or high in religiousness, doesn't really predict whether they're going to approve or disapprove of affirmative action. Even the death penalty, which is somewhat surprising, doesn't really separate the low and the high religious students. But as we go up here, you're going to see there's, they're going to start to separate. That is, uh, marijuana legalization, you can see the low religious students, about half of them said that that was, should be approved versus only about a fifth of the high religious students. And definitely with the top ones, you can see that they're pulling far apart. That is, uh, same-sex relationships, premarital sex, and uh, most with abortion. That's where you see low religious and high religious students disagreeing the most. That is, they're making the judgments of morality most uh, disparately on those issues. So we might then ask ourselves, why those things? Uh, a high religious, low religious student wouldn't uh, make a different judgment on things like murder or lying and stealing, but why those things? This is another study that shows basically the same thing, and that is they correlated somebody's moral view of an issue with how often they go to church. Again, church attendance is pretty easy to, to get data on. That's why they use that. Obviously, it's not a perfect measure of belief. I'll talk about that in a second, but it's a good rough estimate. So some things don't really correlate with how often somebody goes to church. So things like uh, lying or cheating sex, that sort of thing. Uh, whether somebody goes to church often or not, it doesn't affect their moral view. Other things are mildly related to a church attendance, so shoplifting, birth control, some things a little bit more, drugs, cursing, divorce, being disobedient. You can see that that sort of correlation shows there's a modest relationship between how often somebody goes to church and whether they think it's wrong or not. But again, some things are more strongly related, and I illustrated that with more of a, of a directional blob there where you can see that how often somebody goes to church is related to, again, things like alcohol and drug use, sexual behavior, and abortion. I don't know what the difference between casual sex and hooking up is, but they're pretty the same here. <laughs> Whatever. But, uh, okay, so, so clearly, again, I, my point with this is that uh, religiousness is more related to some moral views than others. But, again, why those things? Now, the problem, you can see that this was asking people what their moral view is. Do you think this is right or wrong? You might ask yourself, though, are there any problems with using somebody's self-report, I think this is right or wrong, uh, as a judgment? Somebody could self-report something that might, in fact, not be their true belief, would be one problem. So what we see is that what I'm going to show you now is that there's a bunch of research showing that there is, in fact, a gap between one's self-report and their moral behavior. Obviously, these studies are tougher to do because you have to observe the person and they don't know that they're being observed. But take, for example, a gap between self-report and behavior with honesty. So you can set up a study where you ask people, well, do they think cheating is right or wrong? That's a self-report. But you can actually set up where you observe them, whether they take an extra point on an exam, or maybe they, uh, you set up a situation where they uh, look at the answers to a test. What you find with religion and cheating and honesty is that there is a gap between religion and uh, high religion and low religious people on self-reports, but when you look at actual behavior, there's really no difference. Some studies find you know, different, it's, pretty, it's a pretty weak relationship with the actual behavior. So we would want to ask ourselves, what does that mean that, that religion seems to affect somebody's judgment of cheating being, in the abstract, wrong, but yet it doesn't really seem to relate to the behavior that much? Now, there are some things that actually show on moral behaviors. There, is differences be there are differences between a, a high religious person and a low religious person. So let's look at just a box score. Again, this is a summary of a lot of different stuff. We could go back later if you want to talk about the specific studies. But one thing in which more religious people show an advantage in is charity and volunteer work. So this is sometimes called planned helping because I get to decide when I give money or how many hours I spend, as opposed to something like a spontaneous uh, helping. Uh, a bystander assistance study might have a person, an actor, be by the side of the sidewalk, they're crying, and then you can measure whether somebody stops and helps them or not, would be like a spontaneous one. And there you see that uh, the less planned the situation is, the less of a difference there is between low and high religious people. So some studies show that actually uh, less religious people tend to have an advantage with spontaneous helping, even, especially in a context where the victim is not known to them. Where religious people tend to have an advantage is helping or charity or volunteering in the context where they know the person being helped. 
sometimes this is called minimal prosociality because you're being prosocial with people that you know, friends, neighbors, that kind of thing. Giving to charities, for example, that are religious charities that you can pick where the money goes. Whereas less religious people, the helping tends to be more indiscriminate. Uh, that is, if you look at values, less religious people tend to say, we should help anybody and I don't care who it is. Whether, and even somebody who might violate their sense of values. So some of the research on helping shows that a religious people are more um, discriminating based on maybe a value violator. So like if I'm religious and I find out that the person who needs help is gay or they're a, from a different uh, country or something like that, I might be less likely to help them. Uh, whereas a non-religious person, they sh tend to show helping that doesn't discriminate based on who the victim is. Another thing that's curious about the research is that when you can separate out the person's need to appear helpful, so a helping in a context where it's not anonymous, somebody can see me being helpful, as opposed to helping in a context where the person's anonymous, you do tend to find some evidence that shows that high religious people tend to want to be helpful or be seen as being helpful. Um, but often, less religious people are ones who want to help more based on what the victim or the helpee needs. So for example, there are studies that show where the victim is an actor by the side of the road, like I mentioned, and they might say, I'm fine, leave me alone, I don't need any help. In those cases, less traditionally religious people tend to say, okay, and they walk on. Whereas high religious people tend to give what's called insistent helping, which is, you know, no, no, nonsense, you need help, let's take you somewhere. Which is interesting because, again, uh, it, it gives an indication that there's a need to be helpful or, or at least appear helpful among more religious people that's not present among the less religious people who tend to just base it on what the victim says they need. They didn't need it, so I'm not going to give help to them. Which is what you would expect given what we talked about before with the stereotypical association. That is, not only is the stereotype of religion and morality when you're judging other people, it seems to be present within the people themselves. So they literally might say, on, or on some unconscious level, am I a helpful person? I guess I must be because I'm religious. And it sets up an expectation that they must behave in a, in a helpful or moral way for some situations, but not other situations. And you see this in what's called a self-other bias. Uh, with uh, This is called a holier-than-thou effect. In this study, what they did was they asked, uh, this is a Baylor University, they asked the students to rate how adherent they were to the Ten Commandments and then the commandments in the, in the Bible that say you should love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. They asked, how, uh, in other words, how do you think that you rate as far as being following those rules. And then they asked them, how, what about just random other people? Do you think that other people adhere to those rules? So there's a self-other gap. And you can see that this is something that happens to everybody, that most people say that they themselves are more moral than anonymous other people. But the gap is related to how religious the person is. So you can see from the angle of the lines that the more religious the people get, the more gap there is between them rating their own morality versus rating an anonymous other person's morality. So for example, on the red line, the high religious people show the greatest discrepancy with I'm adherent to the Ten Commandments, but other people aren't. Now one thing, uh, I was when I read this study for the first time, I said, well, maybe actually they are more adherent. That is, it might actually be picking up on the fact that they do follow the Ten Commandments more. The problem with that explanation is that they actually asked them things that didn't have anything to do with religion. So they actually took the top of the top people, the, the highest third of the high, most highly religious and the high fundamentalist people, they actually said that they themselves were better than other people, even on non-religious attributes. So things like um, how smart, how uh, popular, how attractive they are. So this would argue against that they're specifically saying that they are more moral because those aren't really morality type things. So this is why I said this is kind of a holier than thou effect because the more uh, the more religious somebody is, it seems to set up a stereotype that they should be religious, which I would argue creates a kind of moral blind spot. In that, I would be ignoring any evidence that I'm not religious if I think that I should be religious. So let me, uh, I'll show you more evidence that I think points towards that conclusion, but let me use some examples from the domain of sexuality. So I'll talk here about things like uh, sexual activity, a self-report versus behavior, and then we'll talk about like maybe divorce or something like that. So they're, they're, as we saw before, if you recall from those correlations, if somebody is highly religious, they tend to be more disapproving of non-traditional sex. So like uh, homosexuality, obviously, or cheating, sex. Um, but there are some studies that try to look at, well, they asked people, how often do you actually do have 
sex or how many partners have you had? This is a study I, I picked just because it was recent of college age students. The average age is 19, so they're like sophomores or something like that. And they, uh, this, you could, this table here is with women. So they asked them, uh, how about various sexual behaviors? How, how much of these have you done? And they divided it by religious group or category. So you could see there's uh, everywhere from atheist to agnostic to Jewish uh, Christian and then fundamentalist Christian. There's not a lot of difference here. Some differences, you could see that, for example, uh, fundamentalist Christian women and Jewish women say that they've had slightly lower rates of things like sexual intercourse. But the differences really aren't uh, that pervasive. In fact, uh, you can see the slightly lower age at first intercourse among, those, uh, among Christian groups than non-Christian groups. So with, this is with women, actually. You see that there is a slight relationship between their religious category and their sexual behavior. But let me show you with men. This is a table with men, and there's virtually no relationship. Again, uh, I guess one way to summarize these sorts of behaviors, like with cheating and with how many partners they've had, is that um, you don't really see that much of a relationship. If the columns hadn't been labeled as different religious categories, you probably wouldn't make that association with religion at all. So virtually all of these different faith groups have some sort of premarital sex. You can see the figures for men are much, yeah, are higher than with women. But the effect of religion actually with, with men is even less than that with women. So this is what I was talking about with, with behaviors and that kind of thing. Whether somebody is uh, affiliated with a religion is really a poor guide to behavior. But as we saw before, it's a stronger guide to their sexual attitudes, whether they think something's right or wrong. Now let me give you an example of, uh, this isn't necessarily sexual behavior, but like with divorce. If you recall again back that correlational table I showed that uh, the more religious somebody is or the more they go to church, they tend to disapprove of divorce more. Um, but this is something that's uh, somewhat paradoxical because some studies that have been done show that actually some re religious denominations have a higher rate of divorce. This was actually done by a Christian polling group. The Barnard Group is, a, is a, a Christian survey group. And they caused a little bit of a stir a few years ago because they actually detected that some groups, you can see like non-denominational Protestants, had a high rate of divorce compared to some other groups. Uh, so like Catholics and Lutherans are fairly low, but so are atheists and agnostics. Um, so is the study a, a fluke or something? Uh, if you look at um, other data that show, for example, geographical region, there are some states that have higher divorce rates than others. So I, took, I just took from a U.S. statewide divorce rate. These are the top 10 divorce states. Obviously, Nevada is because that's, you know, that's where you go. That's where Brittany goes for her divorces. But, the, um, uh, but other ones there, you can see Arkansas, Wyoming, whatever. Those are the top 10. And then the bottom 10 divorce states are these here. Now, does anybody see a, a, a pattern there of region or uh, of the types of, stu of states there? Anybody see a pattern? Yeah. With some exceptions, those are what we call red states, the ones that have a higher proportion of conservative and religious. In fact, what I did was I took the statewide religious rate and cross-referenced it with this table. So you can see that there are some differences, but there are statewide data like how, on average, how important is religion to you. And then you can see that they compared the top. Uh, there's the top states there, uh, divorce states that uh, many of them are some of the most religious states. So for example, Alabama, Tennessee, and that these are blue states that tend to be more uh, liberal or, or democratic voting, with some exceptions again, but uh, they tend to have a lower average rate of religiosity. In fact, maybe an easier way to look at it would be when, I, when you plot them together. That's the average divorce per state, and then here's how important religion is to the members of that state. Uh, that's a, not a strong correlation, but it's a significant one. So one might ask oneself, when you're looking at this, we saw, again, to, what, what's the point here is that the, the attitudes towards divorce tend to be more frowned upon the more religious somebody is. But when you actually look at things like uh, indicators of religion, there seems to be actually the opposite relationship. So we could ask ourselves, well, is, what is predictive of divorce? Are there other things that would explain that demographically other than red state, blue state? In fact, when you look at research on divorce, the st things that stick out as the strongest predictors aren't really religion. They're just dumb old demographics. That is, things like the younger somebody is when they get married is one of the strongest predictors of divorce. Also, uh, low education and low income. They really don't have much to do with religion, with the exception of that maybe some, here's a hypothesis, maybe to the extent that you emphasize getting married at a young age, to the extent that that could be related to religion, that might actually be producing a higher rate of divorce. Now, keeping that in mind, though, uh, here's some other survey on the average divorce rates among different demographic, uh, uh, religious demographic 
denominational category. So the average percentage of how many adults in the United States that are divorced is 12%. And that's basically right on line with people who are, the average rate within the mainline Protestant denomination is the same. The unaffiliated divorce rate's the same. Unaffiliated meaning the person is uh, not a member of a, of a religious denomination, not a church. Some are lower, so as you would expect, a slightly lower rate for Catholics and Mormons, and then some are higher, so Protestant evangelicals or historically black have a higher divorce rate. But these aren't really huge differences. But you can see it goes against the whole uh, religion, conservative religion would, would decrease a divorce rate. In fact, there's some evidence to the opposite. If you bust out the unaffiliated group, with subtypes. Now, some people are unaffiliated, but they're still religious. They're just not a member of a church. And those people have a slightly higher rate of divorce. It's the people who are completely non-religious within the unaffiliated that have the lowest divorce rate, which again seems paradoxical. So again, we, we would ask ourselves, what's the underlying reason? Now, I'm going to illustrate some, some of the hypotheses that say that religion should predict things like uh, low divorce rate and happiness and pro-social behavior. I'm going to use as a representative David Myers because some of you might be familiar with his intro psych books or social psych books. He's actually at Hope College. Let me, um, some of you might be familiar with his work because he talks about basically the, in some of his published work, how religion creates pro-social communities and attitudes. So this is a popular article that he wrote called The Funds and the Friends and the Faith of Happy People where he argued that uh, religion is one of the forces that tends to socialize people, that makes them happier. Uh, what psychologists would call subjective well-being is higher among religious people, and it lowers uh, the divorce rate. And he's actually taken issue with some of these studies on divorce and happiness by suggesting this. He's criticized them by saying, <coughs> okay, the divorce rate does tend to be higher for some denominations but, or states, but you're looking at a state level, not the individuals within that state. And so he would point out that uh, when you lump together states, that's not really looking at within the state who is high or who is low in religiousness. And the same with things like happiness or health, that uh, it's so like Alabama and Mississippi usually are the least healthy states, but the most religious states. He again would suggest that, that that doesn't look at who within that group are the high and the low religious people. He also points out that using that sort of denominational thing like we were talking about before with the mainstream Protestants versus Catholics, that's misleading as well because it doesn't talk about how devout the person is within that religious category. So, for example, somebody could just be a nominal member of a denomination but not be particularly religious. So uh, one of the things he's put in his article was that compared to uh, with never attenders, the most religiously engaged Americans were half as likely to be divorced and about one-fourth as likely to have been arrested. And he also goes on to say that they're happier as well. And actually, he's right. When you uh, measure religious engagement, let's say like church attendance, the relationship is that higher church attenders do have better outcomes. They have, they're less likely to divorce. They're happier, healthier. So he's right about that. And high church attendance does correlate with a lot of good things. But a couple of things. Oh, here's a graph, actually. You can see that. He mentions this in the article that I just showed you, that the most frequent church attenders are happier than the people who are moderate church attenders and weak church attenders. That's the percentage uh, of people who say they're very happy. So this would be an example of what I call the, the, a linear hypothesis. More, the more religious one is, the more not just a member of a denomination, but the more devout one is in terms of religion, the happier the person is. So like a mental health thing. But here's the problem with that. I'm going to take issue with some of those things. Notice how one thing is that the focus has shifted now from the, um, from one thing to another. That is, the focus has shifted to f attendance to church rather than how much a person believes in God, for example. So you might want to think about it this way if you're a psychologist designing a study. If you have high church attenders and you're saying that that should be correlated with lower divorce or correlated with happiness, what's the opposite of a high church attender if you're trying to measure religious belief? So, so to illustrate this schematically, we have Frequent church attenders, maybe some people who are moderate church attenders, and then low church attenders or infrequent ones. How does somebody's religious belief relate to that? The problem is, is that if you notice that bottom dimension, if, the, if you remember the previous graph, it was that the person goes once every, every blue moon or something like that. That contains more than one group of people. It contains people who we would call probably... Um, uh, unsure religious people, maybe they are say that they believe in God, for example, but don't really, can't be bothered to go to church, or maybe they're indifferent to religious issues, but it also contains people who are strongly non-religious or confidently secular, like atheists and agnostics. 
What I'm going to show you here is that those are two very different groups of people. Because if we're asking ourselves, does religious belief itself correlate with these positive things like happiness, low divorce rate, morality, it's different to ask the question of belief versus whether they're a member of a group or not, because um, being a member of a group itself is separate from one's religious belief. So let me give an example of that. Rather than saying it's a high belief versus unsure, shaky belief people, what if you could find a group of people that were principled non-believers? They didn't have any belief in God, but it was an affirmative thing rather than just, I, can't, I don't care about that stuff. And also, that what if they were members of a specifically secular group? So what I'm arguing here is that there's, a, there's a, the proper comparison group with strong believers who go to a social group like church is, and you're looking at belief, is strong non-believing people who are social members of a group. So this is a study that I actually did that's, that's going to be published this year, uh, where I looked at the uh, specifically secular group. There's a local group called the Center for Inquiry where they are specifically, they talk about secular type issues in an organized group fashion. Most people there are non-religious, although not all. But what I did is I compared them with a sample of church group members. And I asked them questions on like happiness and, and, and divorce and all that and, and health. And what I found is, is that actually, uh, if you look at the certain, this is belief certainty. Some people absolutely believe in God, no question about it. Some people are somewhat sure. As we mentioned before, some people are not sure or don't care. But that, that extends downward into absolute certainty that they, there isn't a God or people who are fairly sure there isn't a God. And you can see once you extend it into that direction, the relationship is curved. If I would have stopped with just the right-hand categories, you would see what David Myers was showing, a nice linear relationship, high, medium, low. But it actually goes back on the other dimension when you talk about things like happiness and life satisfaction. So in other words, what I'm doing here is the appropriate comparison is to compare high religious people who go to church often with strongly non-religious people who go to a social group often. So the completely non-religious, uh, completely religious believers with members of organized groups who are not religious. And when you do that, you don't really see any difference in their mental health. You don't really see any difference in their happiness or their satisfaction with life. And by the way, with divorce, you also find that the church groups have a higher rate of divorce than the secular groups. So again, uh, in response to the, the kind of criticisms that, uh, that Myers was making, often the studies that we see with morality and religion are comparing, are mixing and matching different things. They're doing this sort of thing where they say, okay, I have a moral measure, and I have people who are high church attenders who seem to be better on the moral measure, and then therefore it must be religious belief. The problem with that, as I mentioned, is that that confounds several different things. It could be the belief, that's possible, but it could also be any type of strong belief, not specifically a religious one, like an atheist would have strong beliefs. Uh, or it could be that the people are socialized into a community, that they go to groups. They are not uh, people who, you know, Boo Radley types who stay in their little shack. They actually participate in things, and that could be what's driving the relationship. Now, in regards to different types of moral domains, one thing that I want to refer back to, too, and that is, remember how we said that strongly religious people tend to be higher in things like charity, giving, planned, volunteering, that kind of thing. One thing is that if somebody's a member of a church that does things like charity work and asks people to give money, that can also account for the fact that strong believers also happen to be strong church attenders. So maybe the reason that religious people have an advantage there, again, is not the belief. It's the fact that they are uh, participators in their community. So the other thing that I want to refer back to uh, is that we saw that there are different types of emphasis. Rather than saying these people are moral, those people are not moral, what I'm going to show you now is that people tend to emphasize different aspects of morality, what makes something right or wrong, and it actually uh, goes along with their type of religion. So if you remember back with Jonathan Haidt's model, that he has the theory that there are five different general dom domains of how people make religious decisions. So harm, fairness, in-group, authority, and purity. In one of his studies, he actually found that there's systematic differences between people who are liberal and conservative. Now, I, I recognize that liberal and conservative is not a perfect measure of religion, but conservative people do tend to be more moral, uh, more, more, Freudian slip, more religious, and liberal people tend to be uh, less religious. So you can see here that one thing is different in that people who consider themselves liberal tend to weight more heavily those first two dimensions. Does it harm anybody? And is it fair to anybody? And in that case, what he calls they have an ethics of autonomy. You can do what you want as long as you don't hurt anybody else and it's fair to everybody. That's what makes something right or wrong. It's an individualistic sort of moral decision. 
conservative people tend to weight more heavily everything. They take into account harm and fairness, but they also add those things of, for example, respect for authority or purity. Their type of morality is more what we'd see with kind of a beehive group mentality, and that is, whoa, it's not just enough not to hurt anybody, that's deviant, and that makes it wrong. Or uh, you are not going along with the, what the authority tells you to do, that makes it wrong. So uh, what we're going to see is that probably more religious people tend to have a sense of what's right and wrong where they're looking at different factors than people who are less religious. So I'm going to argue that maybe that's why high and low religious people, if you remember those graphs on the college students, they would say that, for example, a low religious, uh, at, at low ends of the scale, um, religious and non-religious people don't differ with things like lying, cheating, stealing, because those hurt people, and they're not fair. But the things they did differ on were things like abortion, divorce, homosexuality, because those might violate things that conservatives think are more moral dimensions there. Now, another criticism often is that, uh, is that if you didn't have morality, that um, if you didn't have religion, morality would be arbitrary. That is, how would you know what is right and wrong without a, the Bible or God telling you what's right and wrong? As we saw, one answer to that would be you really don't see a lot of difference in a lot of moral behaviors. We saw there's very little difference among religious categories. But I would argue another problem with that is that even when you do have people that have the same religion, they often don't agree on things. So take, for example, what should be a fairly clear statement, don't murder people. Now, is that, uh, you know, People who are religious then should be on board with that, but you can see, let's take the death penalty. There's all kinds of disagreement on whether the death penalty is right or wrong. If you're a conservative Protestant, the data shows that you tend to be more supportive of the death penalty. If you're a liberal Protestant, then you don't support the death penalty as much. And there are some specifically pacifist Christian denominations that don't support that as well. So if they're all moral, but why are they disagree? They're all religious, but why are they disagreeing on the moral issue? And you could add all kinds of other issues too. Stem cells, is that murder? Uh, uh, the use of the military and warfare, is that murder, euthanasia? What tends to fall out more often is not religious, non-religious, but a conservative liberal dimension, that conservatives consider some things right and wrong differently than liberals. Take torture, for example. Take it. So uh, there was a study that was done recently that looked at, uh, by the Pew Forum, I believe, that looked at support for torture against suspected terrorists. And they actually divided the data by what denomination the religious person was. So you could see there that uh, somebody could say that torture is often justified in the red at one extreme versus it's never justified in the blue or anywhere in the middle. But when you divide it by religious denomination, like the uh, second line from the top is white evangelical Protestants tend to be more supportive of torture against suspected terrorists. Uh, or you know, in other words, more conservative, more religious people. The ones who are the least supportive were unaffiliated. Or at the bottom, the people who are more frequent church attenders support torture more. The people who don't go to church uh, often support torture the least. Now, we can get into and argue about whether you know, torture is justified with terrorists, but the point is, is that, again, uh, that you don't really see a difference as a function necessarily of religion, not religion in that group. And I would argue that the reason this happens is, if you recall, uh, liberals tend to weight harm and fairness, whereas conservatives also add things like, for example, in-group loyalty. My, my explanation for this type of data is that what happens is that a conservative might look at that or somebody who's more religious and say, yes, torture might be bad, but they're not a member of my group or they're a suspected terrorist, and that sort of trumps the harmfulness part. Yes, it's wrong to harm people, but if they're not a member of my group, that sort of morality trumps the harmfulness morality. So here's my second uh, response to without religion, there wouldn't be standards for morality, and that would be, I would suggest that moral relativism is actually promoted by certain types of emphasis, those bottom three. Uh, whether something is supported by the authorities, whether it's purity or in-group, that those sorts of things could actually promote uh, moral relativism because then it becomes a matter of, well, uh, God says it's okay. Yes, it's not okay to hurt people, but if it says so here, then I can. Or um, a purity-based morality that's fairly arbitrary are things like you know, dietary restrictions. Why is it wrong to eat pork? It says so here, or it's impure. That sort of morality, I would argue, is more easily rationalized. Because as we saw, the uh, more religious people tend to dis disapprove of things like drinking and drug use and homosexuality, which don't really harm anybody, but that's a violation of purity type things or in-group type norms. Why is uh, homosexuality wrong? Because it's unnatural or it's not the, the, no the norm, rather than it's specifically harmful. So I would argue here that the, the three moral areas that are most subject to relativism are those final three areas there. Because what I mean by relativism is that the reasoning 
in fact, is the, t the tail wagging the dog. First, you have a, an intuition that something's wrong, and then you come up with a reason about why you think it's wrong. That's what I mean by post hoc or after the fact. In fact, Jonathan Haidt's work actually supports this sort of thing as well. His theory about the emotional tail wagging the rational dog suggests that rather than having criteria that are specifically rational, uh, something is right or wrong because you've calculated this and you've thought about it, he would argue that actually we don't have strong criteria, we have a gut response. First, we have an emotional reaction to something that's unconscious often, even intuitive and quick, and then we find reasons for why we thought that thing was wrong only after the fact. So let me give you some examples. He's done experiments where he gives people things that are somewhat weird or wacky, but not really harmful. So he'll ask people to judge, for example, uh, so-and-so has some unusual forms of masturbation. You don't want to know what they are. You can look it up. Uh, or that this person has cleaned their toilet with an American flag. Or uh, a family's pet gets run over, but instead of burying it, they decide to cook it and eat it. Those sorts of things. Now you can see that those things are not specifically damaging. They're just weird or somewhat gross. And what he finds is that what people tend to have is that, that the disgusted reaction carries the day. When he asks them, why did you think that's wrong, they often uh, are at a loss to explain that. In fact, sometimes what he notices is that people sometimes uh, mis misread the scenario where they tried to say it was harmful when, in fact, he has to point them out, uh, well, we didn't really say that it hurt anybody. Uh, the dog was already dead, for example, when they ate it, that sort of thing. And he calls this moral dumbfounding. They kind of sputtered. I don't know. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. It's wrong because. I don't know. So what, uh, in some of his research, he actually finds out that what predicts judgments of morality more is their affective emotional reaction. Ooh, yuck. Therefore, it's wrong. Not really by whether it hurt anybody or not. The reason I think this is important is because it suggests that for many situations, rather than having clear rules about morality, what, what really happens is a rationalization process. So again, the person says, yuck, it's wrong, and then when asked why it's wrong, they just come up with a reason after the fact. Let me give you some examples of that that might work with things like religion and morality. So historically, uh, getting away from the empirical stuff for just a second, uh, religion has really played both sides of the coin when it comes to something like, let's take racial prejudice or uh, things like civil rights or slavery. There was a, a psychologist about 40 or 50 years ago, Gordon Allport, who studied people's attitudes like prejudice, and he kept getting data that really found that religion showed all kinds of different relationships. Uh, for example, he found that people who were more religious sometimes were more prejudiced, but he also found that people who were the least religious were the least prejudiced, and it just went all across the map. And so he, just, he was at a loss. He said, this is paradoxical. It seems to create prejudice in some situations to be religious, but solve prejudice in others. And we could think of this historically, too. So if you know your history, for example, abolitionism to slavery or support of civil rights has often been done specifically through a religious framework. Slavery is wrong, and uh, civil rights is right, and they use religious language to couch that, but it also has worked the other way, too, that sometimes prejudice has been increased or justified through the use of religion. So slavery is right. Um, there's a concept called the curse of ham that many slave owners use to suggest that people with different colored skin were actually the descendants of uh, Noah's, son, uh, Noah's son Ham, who was cursed because he saw his father naked. I don't know what sense that makes, but uh, he saw his father naked and he was marked on his skin and he was sent away. And so many slave owners said that's why it's okay to have slaves who are different races because they have the mark of Ham or the curse of Ham. And so you can see things like anti-Semitism have been often supported through the use of religion too. Now, how is it that the same doctrines could actually work both sides of the coin? There's some evidence using psychology that suggests that what happens is that people often justify their prejudice and that sometimes religion can be used to do that. So this is a, a modern model of prejudice called the justification suppression model, which suggests that many forms of prejudice are actually unconscious. Somebody is not really even aware that they are prejudiced. And what happens is as the prejudice makes its way to the surface to actual behaviors, different forces can either promote or inhibit it. So a person can suppress prejudice by saying, you know, it's wrong to treat people uh, differently. But it can also justify prejudice such that when the, uh, those forces fight each other out and when the prejudice is actually expressed with uh, something you say or do, it's actually uh, sometimes masked from its original form. So again, we could think of a religious role on either side of the coin. If somebody 
as religious, they could say it's wrong to be prejudiced. You should treat people like you want to be treated, or you should love your neighbor. But there's also instances like we just saw where it actually justifies the prejudice by saying, yeah, but that person's not a member of my group, and that's why it's okay. So when something usually comes out in the form of prejudice, you often hear this person saying that, uh, you know, it's not really that I'm racist, but usually what follows out of their mouths is something racist. Have you guys seen the uh, Asians in the Library video, girl? This is, yeah, so she starts by saying, it's not that I have anything against Asians, but, and then she has things against Asians. So. Um, it's, it's on YouTube, it's awful. But in this sort of thing, often people, what they do is they use a religious justification for something that probably otherwise could not be justified. So in the case of slavery, you know, 100 years ago, people were making specifically religious justifications based on the Bible, why it's okay to have slaves, because they're not from our group. Uh, don't make a slave of a fe fellow Israelite was the rule. And so, again, it's not a theological argument, but that seemed perfectly acceptable to many people. So this would be an uh, explanation why the in-group loyalty thing can trump harmfulness, because a person can then justify it somehow. And it allows a rationalization of things like uh, negative behavior. They can say, because it says so, or because uh, that person's not a group member. Um, let's see, we're running out of time. But let me actually skip ahead here. I'm running out of time. Uh, I want to uh, do a. I want to talk about then. Where would? Yeah, wait, we have to leave time for Q and A though. So. All right. Well, let's go back and. What the heck? Um, let me actually uh, do this. Oh, okay. Here's a study that was done actually in Israel. This illustrates what I'm talking about. Uh, there was an Israeli psychologist named George Tamarin who had uh, school children, this is back about 40 years ago, he had school children actually uh, come in and rate uh, the appropriateness of various uh, actions based on the Bible. So if you're familiar with the story of Joshua, he had them read the, the book, uh, the story of Joshua, where he marches around the city of Jericho because they were at war with the Israelites, and then they blow the trumpet, and then the walls come down. I actually found this in a children's book. You might know that song of Joshua and the Jericho. The walls came tumbling down is, is the thing. So, uh, but they don't put this part in the children's book, and that is the people were all slaughtered, young, old, everything. So I, don't, I couldn't find an illustration of the slaughtering. So, the, um, so what Tamarin asked the kids then is, remember, these are Israeli kids, and he asked them, did Joshua act correctly or not? Okay? And here's what he found is that about two-thirds of them said, yeah, he did act correctly, and only a minority disapproved of him, Joshua's actions. Uh, and I, here's an example of what one of the kids said. He said, Joshua did good because the people who inhabited the land were of a different religion. And when Joshua killed them, he wiped their religion from the earth. So you could see that this kid, at least, was using a specifically religious justification because Joshua's their man. He's an he's a ancestor. Now, Tamron had a control condition where he asked the same scenario. Uh, an army was fighting another army, the walled city, the horns, everything, uh, blow the walls down, slaughtered everyone. But he changed the, who the person was. Instead of Joshua, it was General Lin from China, not in Israel. And he asked him the same thing. Do you approve or not? And probably no surprise, hardly anybody approved. So, I mean, what is this other than a in-group based distinction that people are making? So when somebody this is, uh, uh, is making a decision about right or wrong actions, uh, that is a problem because I would argue again that this is more easily rationalized if you have uh, a context to rationalize it. One is that th as soon as you contextualize something as being a religious action, so I'm, I'm doing this for a religious reason, that kind of removes it from any type of scrutiny about, you know, is this the best thing to do? Is it, what's the evidence that this is right? It removes it from that sort of rational discussion. And also, uh, religious texts, like I mentioned with a passage here, it actually, they are fairly complex and not easily understood. And so uh, it enables the person to twist them or turn them into a direction where they can rationalize something. And it would really, outside of religious context, it's not really defensible. So we could think of things like, you know, Abraham killing Isaac or uh, God smiting Job, that those things are often uh, cited as examples of being correct because they're obedience. That he was following order. I'm just following orders, essentially. Uh, so I would say that, that that promotes some relativistic actions because the, the individual can just say, hey, yes, it would be, un I wouldn't be able to get away with that, but he did because he was following orders. And there you see that area of heights, area of obedience to authority coming through. Now, when you look at things like statistically, you really find that uh, one question is, if there is an overlap between religion and something like prejudice or whatnot, that um, 
is it really the religion that's doing it or is it some other thing that's responsible? And when you actually do statistical type studies, you find out that there are what's called a third variable is going on. People who are more religious tend to, like we saw, approve of authority and in-group type favoritism. That's not really part of their religious content. So if I could remove, for example, the part of religion that has to do with authoritarianism, you actually see the relationship disappear between religion and prejudice. In fact, sometimes it reverses to be the opposite, that more religious people would be less prejudiced if you control for the fact that they also tend to be authoritarian. So to put that verbally, it's that uh, if you control for the fact that people who are more religious also happen to be more authoritarian, actually uh, religion isn't related to prejudice. It's not the religious content, it's that the religious content is sort of justified through the authoritarianism. So, um, where would morality come from if it doesn't have a religious context? That's my final point. And that is that, uh, let me give you a scenario here. Some of you might have heard of this in your various classes. This has made its way around uh, philosophy for a while, but now we're studying this empirically in psychology, and that is intuitive morality. Uh, here's, a, here's a scenario to consider. You are walking alongside trolley tracks, and you see that five people, for whatever reason, here they're tied up. I don't know why. Don't ask yourself why. They're going to be killed by a trolley. It's going to come down and kill them unless you flip a switch so that that would shunt the trolley onto a different track. Now, unfortunately, there is a guy there, too, and he's going to be killed. Would you flip the switch is the question they ask people. And most people say, you know, it's regrettable that you're going to kill one guy, but, you know, do the math. Five is, is um, saving five people is better than that. So they're given a second scenario. Uh, here you're over the tracks on a bridge looking down, and the same thing is that five people are going to be killed. If you do nothing, five people will be killed. It's the exact same thing number-wise. But you're standing next to a very, very large man who's leaning over. One little push could just knock him off. And his body's big enough where it would derail the trolley. Again, just go with it. Uh, it would derail the trolley, and you'd save the five people, but regrettably, he would be killed. Would you do that? So a utilitarian, this is the same scenario. Five, save five, sacrifice one. But when you ask people the second scenario, as you might imagine, people are more queasy about that. You find... Uh, that, again, some of these answers are universal across different cultures. Many fewer people say, yes, I would push the fat guy, then flip the switch. And they take much longer to decide. And what's more interesting is that they have different brain areas when they've done this with people's head in the brain scanner that are activated. It seems to involve different types of decisions. This one, the second one, is more emotional and gut level than the first one, which tends to be much more of a rational decision. So if you want to ask yourself, why would there be a discrepant response so the implications for morality are, if morality is rational, you just do add up the numbers and do an action, it doesn't seem to be supported by this thing. So brain-wise, what happens is that uh, if you've done your neuropsych, you know that the frontal lobes tend to be involved in high order things like judgment, calculation, decision making. And the emotional responses tend to be deep within the, the lizard brain, the, the limbic system. These are things that evolved very early on that have to do with fight or flight response, like the amygdala. And that's what tends to be activated by the second scenario. So what this would suggest is a lot of morality is actually there are different systems giving you different moral answers. So uh, a frontal lobe person would do the math. Uh, an, uh, an amygdala activated person would say, no, it's wrong to push somebody off the bridge. Does anybody recognize this guy? Yeah. He's Phineas Gage. The clue is the object he's holding in his hands. Incredibly, he was, uh, that object was blown through his skull. He was a railroad, railroad worker back in the 1860s. He was working with what's called a tamping iron with blasting powder, and the thing went off, and it shot up through his cheekbone. He lost an eye, as you can see, and it went out the top of his head. But he survived that devastating injury. The interesting thing that you hear about in psychology textbooks is that his, uh, he, was, he lived, but his personality was changed. People said before the accident, he was a responsible, sober type individual. Uh, but after the accident, he was uncontrollable. He would fly into a rage. He drank. He was profane. Basically, this was history's first neuropsych uh, experiment in that what he did was decouple the frontal lobe from the rest of his brain. And that's why it explained his what's disinhibition, really. He was unable to inhibit his actions afterwards. This type of research, and there's other brain stuff that's being done uh, that's really cool lately, is showing that actually a lot of morality is physically determined by the brain. The decisions we make, right or wrong, actually have a physical substrate. And this sort of, uh, you know, we can do, we can't, lobotomize people, at least now, not now anyway, legally. But this sort of experiment shows that what happens, uh, it's not a, he didn't have a lack of moral teaching. He didn't suddenly become a wicked person. 
but he didn't have the ability to inhibit his behavior. So really, a lot of immoral behavior is not a rational deficit. It's an emotional deficit. So if you think of a psychopath, these are people who, who it's not that they don't know what's right or wrong or haven't been taught. They just don't feel things like empathy. They don't have the emotional reactions when confronted with pain and suffering that you and I do. The other thing that's, uh, that shows that morality is not really rational is that it's learned a lot earlier than what we thought it is. Uh, in contrast to a blank slate model where kids are just born blank and you teach them, you know, don't do that and don't hurt that person. Actually, you can test through infants that they have what's a proto-moral reaction at very, very young ages. So there's some experiments that are done with like puppets where they get to see one puppet selfish and he keeps the ball and another puppet is shares the ball with it and then they can choose which one they like. At a very young age, they know uh, at a high level to choose the sharing puppet or even abstract shapes that do the same behaviors. They know what cooperation looks like. Where does that come from if they haven't been taught that? So there's some evidence that shows that, uh, that morality, moral decisions are, are wired in at some basic level. Obviously, there are things that are taught, but other things are emotional reactions are wired in. There's also research that shows that we have a, a much more unconscious moral reactions than what had been thought. So uh, if you look at the, the amygdala and the limbic system, again, I have my arrow pointing to a specific the olfactory duct, which if you think about evolutionary history, when we first evolved in a primordial soup, we didn't have hearing or vision. What mattered was chemical senses. That's a very primitive sense. You might have experienced this too, that sometimes you can have smell something, have a very emotional reaction, but not even know why necessarily at the beginning. We have some studies that show, and a lot of this stuff is, is recent, that actually we make an association, even at an unconscious level, of moral purity with physical purity versus contamination. So, just as, uh, as an overview, uh, when people sit at dirty, filthy desks or are given filthy writing objects to work, they actually cha it changes their moral judgment. They become more morally judgmental. Uh, and the reverse, when they are exposed to citrusy, fresh cleaning smells, they show moral reactions to that too. They become more charitable in a sharing game when they smell clean stuff uh, than the control conditions. Some of this stuff is really kind of freaky because it's at an unconscious level. Uh, there's actually a study that I like, one of my favorites is that they have people write about somebody else's unethical deed. They say it's a handwriting study, just copy down this uh, ethical versus unethical deed. And on the way out they said, oh, you know what, we have some products that you could choose from. Would you like to choose some of these products? It turns out that people who wrote about the shady thing, it wasn't even their shady action, choose the cleaning product over the non-cleaning product compared to the control condition. So again, the bottom line with some of this stuff is that moral judgments tend to be much more irrational than what we had thought. And actually, you can morally, you can manipulate moral judgment. If some of you have seen those TED Talks online, I encourage you to go to see the one by Rebecca Sachs. It's very cool because what she shows is that you can actually alter somebody's view of a moral situation through a physical manipulation. Unfortunately, she doesn't lobotomize people, but what she does do, no, I'm just kidding, is that she, uh, she uses what's called a, a mag transcranial magnetic stimulation. So these like ping pong paddles that you can actually temporarily alter somebody's brain through magnetic fields, and she can change somebody's judgment about whether an action is right or wrong. And that's freaky. So uh, it's very interesting because it shows that a lot of this stuff is, again, at a very uh, primitive emotional type level. So referring back to the stuff we talked about, many moral judgments, like the ones we talked about here, are based on purity and disgust rather than any rational criteria about whether something's right or wrong. The stuff that comes out might be justified through moral, through rational means, but not otherwise. And finally, there's the, the evidence that a lot of morality or proto-morality uh, has a hard wiring or is instinctual comes from uh, evolutionary psychology or animal comparative psychology. Uh, take chimpanzees. They're very social animals, and they have the basics now of, of moral type behavior. We might not always agree with the moral principles when a chimp kills another chimp, but they do show elements of things like distinguishing family from non-family, or uh, distinguishing somebody who had been helpful yesterday, but he's no longer helpful today, or is being a brat. That chimps actually make a distinction, and they do things like punish the free riders in their group. If somebody is not contributing, they don't give that share of food with that, with that chimp. So there's a lot of things that we talked about that are empathy, uh, uh, a re reciprocity. If I give something to you, you better share with me the next time that are not learned, but these seem to be wired into any type of social animal. And we are very intensely social. And so a lot of the evolutionary psych theories of morality are that these templates of morality have evolved for uh, specific reasons because they're beneficial to social animals. So once again, 
given our five areas, you might think of harmfulness avoidance as being an empathy response that we share with social animals. Or uh, take authority. Uh, chimps know who the alpha male is and who is the lower ranking males. They also make a distinction based on authority. You can hit this chimp but not that hit chimp. So, so just to summarize uh, what, what I've talked about today, that the, I believe that the, the rational model that we've had so far, that when you have uh, teachings of, of moral, morality through religion, and that leads to the development over time of rules that are written down as being moral prescriptions, and that's learned then, and that leads to your emotional reaction to where you wouldn't have known that that was immoral if you hadn't learned it. That's actually, I think, somewhat backwards in that a lot more of morality tends to be a gut level reaction that's intuitive or even like we just saw evolved and that leads to both the moral uh, rules being written down they're a recognition of what we already knew on a gut level and also religious rules so uh, that's why we would recognize killing in some situations killing would be wrong is because we have that intuition already and so then we say because God says so as a rationalization of that so let me finish with a quote. I think this summarizes a lot of this from Susan B. Anthony. She said, I distrust those people who know so well what God wants them to do because I notice it always coincides with their own desires. Or uh, you have to end with something that Lincoln wrote because Lincoln's the best. Many people were coming to Lincoln saying he should uh, allow slavery or abolish slavery. It was contradictory. And in one speech he said this, I am approached with the most opposite opinions and advice, and that by religious men who are equally certain that they represent the divine will. I hope it will not be irreverent of me to say that if it is probable that God would reveal his will to others and a point so connected with my duty, it might be supposed that he would reveal it directly to me. These are not, however, the days of miracles. I must study the plain physical facts of the case, ascertain what is possible, and learn what appears to be wise and right. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is when I showed, I was talking about some of the statistical things. So the question was uh, the, uh, about the issue of if religion is correlated with prejudice, but uh, if you could have somebody who's not religious, would they be prejudiced? So I was talking about this kind of thing. The explanation for that is if you follow, some, a lot of these studies are statistical with what they do is that they statistically remove, they give somebody a measure of how religious they are, and they give somebody a measure of how authoritarian they are. So there's questions like, you know, the rules should always be followed, and uh, if somebody's deviant, they're, they're wrong, or something like that. And what happens is that they, you can statistically remove what's called the variance from one from the other. So literally, what it does verbally is to, is to say, if you could have somebody who is religious, but who isn't authoritarian, that's why I said then you would have something like those lower figures where they wouldn't be related. So that means that if you would cross-reference religion and authoritarianism, there does tend to be a relationship um, I'm not sure of the exact correlation, it depends on the study, but there, there are some people who are high and religious but not an authoritarian. And so when you, uh, basically it's, you could look at that as a glass half empty, half full. And that is, one, the glass half empty for religion is, it doesn't seem to be the religious content itself necessarily that would increase prejudice, that many people have, like I was trying to argue in a couple points, that they might justify 
their authoritarianism through religious means, but it's not the religious content. A glass half empty, though, is that people who are more religious do tend to be more authoritarian. So it's, I know that seems like it's a, it's, a, it's a contradiction, but basically there's ways that you can try to separate the two things. Bob? Yeah, that's a complex issue because it also, uh, so the question was, what about male-female differences with uh, religion and uh, do, uh, do females exhibit more of a communitarian, I think is what you're asking. That's a complex issue because on one hand, women tend to be more religious and it's across all the different measures. It's not only church attendance, but it's also personal religiosity. Depending on the survey, you see about a 5 or 10% gap where women tend to say that they're more religious than men. However, a lot of the, like we saw, a lot of the things that come out of religion that are, tend to be the more authoritarian ones tend to be more male-oriented. So you do see, I guess the, it's a complicated issue, but what you do tend to see is that when women are religious, it does tend to be more, in moral domains, they do tend to emphasize things like fairness and harmfulness more than men. Now again, what the, the key is, what's the explanation to that? You can go anywhere from social learning, stereotypes, here's how women should be, to there's even people that suggest some sort of biological explanation like you know with the chimps that you have an alpha male sort of system where the boys fight it out and the, the women just you know back off that boy men are more interested in authoritarian hierarchies than women so I think the key issue with that one is, is we don't know yet you know what accounts for the differences with men and women's morality uh, and religion yeah in back Oh, yeah, so the, the issue is the, the, um, your first point about the relationship with the spirituality and the belief content versus a member of, of a religion. You do, one of the, I think what people are converging on now in the research world is that religion is not one thing. And in fact, Jonathan Haidt himself has argued that religion tends to be more, like, like I mentioned in the talk, about group belonging than, than a, a spiritual content to where, like you said, it can actually be separated. I mean, there are many people who aren't a member of a, a, a a group or don't join. In fact, what we've seen over the past decade or couple decades in America is that much, many more people are saying that they're spiritual but not religious, the SBNRs, than, uh, and people tend to be leaving organized religion more. And so there is, there is uh, an increasing distinction between the personal belief system, spiritual beliefs, and the organizational component. I think that, that things like the church has turned people off, especially because it became associated with things like more conservative 
authoritarian causes. So you see the figures of that drop during, for example, the, the past decade. But the second point, though, though about things like um, spirituality and the, and the gender and sex differences, actually I found an interesting thing in my study with, I mentioned the secular group, and that is it's much more likely for women to say that they are spiritual but not religious than men, even those that consider themselves basically completely non-religious. So I, if you recall, I showed that figure of people who say that they absolutely don't believe in God or partially don't believe in God. So you had more of the case with women saying, I don't believe in God, but I'm going to call myself spiritual, whereas with men, they tend to more often label themselves atheist. So part of that, again, you could use a social explanation that maybe for uh, for women being more religious or, or more involved in social groups, it means more to them, whereas it seems more acceptable to men to be kind of, a, to use the A word or to label themselves as a, you know, something that might look like a cranky loner, um, you know, but, uh, but that the, for women that tends to be frowned upon or less acceptable, although that might be changing, so. Yes, you're in back. Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the question regards uh, emotionality and and, um, and things like genetics, the uh, the <coughs> or morality. The um, more and more the research is showing, and some of this discomforts some people because we're used to thinking of moral decisions uh, that people people are often cool with things like well your sexuality or maybe your aggression. Clearly, that would have a biological component, but not my morality. And I think what's discomforting to many people is that that that's where a lot of the research tends to be heading, and that is, um, or even they're comfortable with the fact that maybe a sociopath could have a broken brain, or maybe born with a, a you know, a, a bad gene, an evil seed gene, or something like that. But if you look at it on a continuum, I mean, personality we're finding out has a large genetic component, and things like empathy or b being able to sympathize with someone, there's uh, there's biological and genetic factors with that. So some of you might have heard of things like hormones being studied, like uh, oxytocin, the trust hormone. We can, gen we can genetically engineer animals that don't produce oxytocin and they don't bond with their kids, their pups, or their, you know, or their sexual partners. The, uh, the, the, the most monogamous animal, I think, is the prairie vole and has a super high off the chart level of oxytocin. So there's, there's an example where a biological substrate relates to what we would consider like a social bonding emotional behavior. And I guarantee you that in the next you know, few years, there'll be more and more research that suggests that many of our judgments that we previously had thought would be moral, rational judgments actually have some sort of biological basis or, or genetic ones. That is, that when somebody's being a jerk or that they seem like they're callous, that person might have a substantial genetic, along with learning, but a, a, a biological component where they literally you know, feel things differently than other people. So you're talking like theories with uh, evolutionary psychology, like a third party observing you, the belief that somebody's watching you and that makes people more moral? Is that... Is that mm-hmm. Yeah, so some... Uh, some of this work in, in psychology of religion from an evolutionary psych perspective hypothesizes that part of the moral component that we have gods that are interested, often more interested in our moral behavior than other types of behavior, that that seems to be a systematic relationship throughout you know, anthropology and different tribes and such. That is, 
if you follow the, the reasoning that one of the things that makes people, keeps people moral is a sense that maybe that the belief system seems to be wired in that beings up in the sky monitor and are concerned about what we do. Sometimes they're God, sometimes they're the ancestors. Um, and so I think that that is what, what we said before about religion not being one thing, that there are different systems in the brain that generate different things that we call religious. That some of them might have to do with things like sharing with a group, some of them have to do with moral actions. Um, there's even some people that argue that religion supports morality that point to experiments showing that when somebody thinks there's a third party watching them that they behave more morally. So there's some actually kind of funny studies where they suggest to the subject in a sharing task where they are measuring their, their generosity or, or their cheating that there had been a ghost scene in the department before. Just BT dubs, you know, just, and then do the experiment. And that those people are more honest and more sharing indicating that maybe the idea that you're being watched by some third party might activate a sense of, oh, I better you know, be good. However, there are other studies showing that you don't even need supernatural ones that simply, oh, here's a, uh, there are studies showing this where a person has to flip a coin and then themselves report the coin toss, uh, uh, the results of it, and the coin toss often determines whether they have to do something unpleasant or not. As you might imagine, often people fudge the coin toss where they're like, oh, it's, t it's heads. You know what object placed in the room made people most moral? Uh, a mirror. Simply having to see themselves in a mirror did that. And also they've done studies showing that eye spots, like those you know, Egyptian eyes with the thing, put, uh, put that on a computer monitor and the people cheat less in a game. So sometimes honesty and morality can be primed through religious mechanisms, thinking that God is watching you can be that. But you can actually you can do it through secular mechanisms too of just making them more self-aware of looking themselves in the mirror, for example. Yeah, so is your question, I think if I read you correctly, is regarding uh, cultural, and some cultures might have the same rule but couch it in religious terms and other cultures might have a rule that's not religious, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so some people have pointed to, for example, uh, it's argued that some of the most moral nations on the planet uh, or cultures like, say, Scandinavia, they have very functional societies that has the lowest rate of religious belief. And often the theories that go along with that are that they've socialized a lot of the religious rules to where it's, you know, like they trust each other. Uh, they often report that they don't need, you know, God monitoring them to make them good, but they simply think it is just a social policy. So again, like I put in the, the model that often people, uh, what they do is you could interpret the moral intuition as being coming from God or a religious message, but many other people simply have the same rule and they interpret it through a non-religious mechanism, a, a, a quid pro quo, a social contract. Why should I not speed as I leave here today and go down the, hallway, uh, the, the highway and run over people? Because I wouldn't like it if other people did that. Now I can use a religious thing to say I shouldn't do it because God would frown on me and that would be one way to explain it. Or I can simply do it where I don't do it because it makes my society better if you don't do it to me and that's why I should do it. So there's different ways to get to the same end point. Where is it? Oh, okay. I don't know specific, so the question is uh, differences in moral behavior from somebody who's just brought into a religious setting versus people who traditionally had chosen that. I don't know of any specific studies with that, but there is some interesting work with people who, who are um, often given a contextual religious message. So I mentioned before there are some studies that show in a laboratory task, there's tasks of like sharing with partners about how generous or how trusting you are. And there are some studies that show that when you flash like religious contextual messages on the screen, that people become more honest and more sharing. So there would be some evidence that uh, a, a prime or a context that's religious can cause people to be more moral. The, the kick though with those experiments is often they have the same effect on people who aren't religious as people who are, indicating that it's not a uniquely religious message, but it can be activated in people because they associate, like I mentioned, the stereotype of, oh, it's a religious thing, I better be good not because even that they personally are religious or not. And sometimes you can get the same results of sharing and, and quid pro quo uh, through secular primes that are moral. So things like uh, instead of flashing on the screen God and Jesus and Bible, 
to make people honest, which does work, flashing on court or civil or things like that. And you can get the same results. So there's some evidence to answer the, your question um, that, yes, uh, often even in people who aren't, don't have a history of themselves of being religious, they can be made more moral because of their association of religiousness, but it actually works the same for other types of things as well. It's not uniquely religious. Um, yep. Um, I don't know as much about that. One thing that's, that hampers a lot of that research is that uh, some of the stuff we do tends to be in a, in a North American, Western context, and there isn't as much studies with people that have a I guess you'd call it an Eastern belief, that the personal God, maybe not, but do believe that what goes around comes around. And I know there's not as much with that simply, f not because it's not an interesting question, because it is, but because um, we, do, we don't tend to work with samples as much in Eastern traditions that have that. If I were to venture a prediction, though, I would say that you would find very similar results to that, that it doesn't necessarily require a personal God, you know, keeping tracks of, of you know, you've done this, like Santa Claus or whatever, but just the notion of, of if you do wrong things, they eventually come back to get you, would probably have the same effect. Ah. So the question is, the in the priming studies the, with third party is the result uh, should it be called morality I mean I guess you get in a little bit into semantics with that probably what most people mean by morality uh, what you're su suggesting the points well taken that we're probably trying to infer a characteristic that crosses different situations such that when you do like a lab study or a priming study yes the person's behavior might be altered in that context but would it generalize unfortunately what you find and this is a problem in like personality psychology in general is there's not a lot of traits that really generalize across a broad variety of situations that is, we're much more, you guys have probably heard of like the Milgram study, where the people shocked uh, because the experimenter told them to shock, and almost, you know, two-thirds of people uh, did this. And social psychology usually points out that we're much more contextually driven, and almost anybody would do stuff given the right context. But, um, when you, and so that's reflected in a lot of moral measures don't correlate with, with each other. So like things like, you know, would you cheat on your taxes? Would you ever hurt anybody? Uh, do you give to charity? A lot of those things, when you look at s even self-reports, they don't really correlate that much with each other. Saying that somebody doesn't cheat on their taxes doesn't really tell you that much about whether they're nice or not. So if, if you're trying to predict this future quality of would this person be golden in a lot of different situations, that correlation's fairly low. It, yeah. Yeah, the question is kind of like a biological determinism model. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue that, it's p that moral actions are purely either socially learned or s biological. Almost everybody who, who's you know, reputable, there's, a, there's an interplay between one's history. So for example, a lot of studies we talked about like uh, immoral people, like sociopaths. There are studies that show that you know, uh, biological children of mothers and fathers who have sociopathic problems, when they're adopted away into different families, they actually have a higher rate than other kids of sociopathy, but sometimes that relationship only holds when they're in a inconsistent house with the uh, 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 adopted parents. That is, it takes, that's an example where it takes the interaction of the two that you might be set up for um, having not moral behavior through your wiring and your genetics, but it's exacerbated a lot if you're raised within an environment that fosters that, that's inconsistent or your parents aren't loving. So there are many people saying that whatever the biological research, the power of the environment can be such that it trumps a lot of that stuff. So that, that there's nobody who's really, there are very few people who would said to be like born immoral that you can, that you can address that through contextual manipulation. Uh, I'm not willing to venture on that. That's not in, uh, in my area, but uh, you, I would argue that a lot of people who end up being, let's just say like, you know, criminals and pathological, you know, criminals, that some of that can, a lot of that can be addressed through in the environment. Uh, there might be a proportion of those people, again, this is not my area, there might be a proportion of that that are born with something very defective that could be less easily altered. 
but I know that's vague, but I don't know that much about that. Uh, I'm not familiar with having and being, what that means. Like a materialistic type attitude? or I'm not as familiar with, with that dimension, but um, authoritarianism is a fairly well-studied phenomenon. Again, that, that, that people tend to differ almost like a personality trait in their in their willingness to submit and respect authorities versus non-authoritarian people who tend to be more, you know, follow the beat of their own drum. And that, that tends to cross some situations, too. I'm not as familiar with the second dimension that you talked about having and being, but I would imagine that some aspects of materialism and that sort of thing would correlate with higher authoritarian. So.